Welcome, everybody. Um, it was quickly only just watching them as we were coming in just before we started about the different locations people are coming from. So um, it's lovely to know that you're here and joining us today. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this information session on the Masters of Education um, in Human Ecology in Everyday Life. Um, and it's wonderful that you're here and hopefully um, with a number of you sitting on questions, we'll have all the answers that you need. Before we get started, I'd like to do land acknowledgement. Um, University of British Columbia Vancouver campus is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people. It's a place and space for learning that the Musqueam people have, have engaged with for millennia. Um, and we are privileged to be here, or I am privileged to be here to work um, from such a space as an uninvited uh, guest. For wherever you are, I would like you to take a moment to reflect on um, whose land that you stand um, and um, give acknowledgement to the first people um, in that particular space. Agenda, what we're going to take you through. Um, I'm straight up after this, we'll do some introductions, but we're going to give you some program overview and also some information around applications and admissions. And then we'll have time for any questions that you may have that we have not yet addressed. Um, and so I think we can get through this in a timely fashion. So I'd like to acknowledge that um, Kelvin is here um, and he's been the person you've been in contact with so far. Um, Kelvin is the senior program assistant for this program, um, works magic behind the scene, knows things that I don't know. Um, and um, I'm very grateful to have him as a colleague to be able to work with. Um, my name is Kerry Rennick and I coordinate um, the HEAL program. And I also would like to acknowledge Chrissy Smith, whose name isn't up on the screen, but who's lovely face is there on the side. Um, sorry, it's on the side for me. I'm not sure where it might be for you. Um, but Chrissy is a graduate of the Hill program. And so I've invited her along um, to share with you some of the good, the bad, and probably the ugly bits of engaging with the Hill program so that you get a bit of an honest um, response about what it's like to live in and to survive and thrive through the program. So Chrissy, thank you. It's lovely to have you here. So the Faculty of Education and particularly the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy is where I'm located. Um, and we have an incredibly supportive department head for the HEAL program. Um, the EDCP is the only um, faculty or Department of Faculty of Education that offers anything to do with home economics in uh, the province of BC. Um, and um, it's been a successful program. It's a growing program and it would be wonderful to know that you would be a part of it as we continue on. Uh, the Masters uh, is a two and a half year program. So people think that it's only two years, but it is two and a half. And some people take a little bit longer. Um, some people are still making families, but life happens, um, promotions, time out, various different things. But we aim to get you through in two and a half years. So far, we have had 79 students graduate from this program since 2010. We have currently 16 um, in the current cohort, and they'll be finished come April um, 2025. Was that terrible to talk about that late? Um, it is a unique program. Uh, we invite home economics professionals, both those who are teachers, but also working in other areas, as well as allied professionals to join with the program. Um, and those with an interest with what overlaps with home economics, human ecology, family studies, uh, food studies, textile studies. What have I left out, Chrissy? There's a whole lot that's there, isn't there? Going through it, wonderful. The program consists of 30 credits, of which there are eight core, and we invite you to explore two uh, electives that may be online or face-to-face -face, um, that al uh, allows you to follow some of your interests as you are working through. Applications close the 1st of March, 2024, and that's for a start, um, all being well, um, for you in September 2024. And there are further details there and the hyperlink will take you. But I suspect if you're already here, you're already familiar with that website as well. 
This is what the program looks like. Um, it is very lockstep. We take you through as a cohort. And so we start with September 2024 with Foundations of Home Economics Education. Then the next term, we move you into uh, Introduction to Curriculum Issues and Theories. And then we move you on into some more specific work around home economics, home economics and transformative pedagogies, research methods, reviewing of research um, in home economics curriculum and pedagogy. And then in the last two, particularly explicitly, we're asking you to work on your graduating paper. And that's a question that a number of you have asked, is there a thesis or is there a capstone project? Yes, there is a capstone project. Um, and there are some amazing things that the HEAL students actually engage with. And you'll get to see what some of those are through the program. The Masters um, also has two electives where you can take electives at a three or 400 level or at a 500 level. If you are able to do some on campus, you're very welcome to do those. They can be done through summer institutes. Um, and the intention is that you expand your interest and understanding around home economics education in any number of these areas. And that includes Indigenous education, agriculture in the classroom. And we're actually building a suite of courses that are engaging with family and sustainability um, that are coming online as well. So some of those may be of interest to you. Uh, Chrissy, can I throw to you, um, we, I'll invite you back for the question and answer session as well, um, but Chrissy, can you give us a little bit of insight as to your experience of what you, of how you found the HEAL program when you went through? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so hi, I'm Chrissy Smith. Um, I'm currently a second year doctoral student at UBC uh, within home economics education. Uh, my research interest and my love is in with food and food literacy. Um, but I was also previously in the classroom, the K-12 classroom, for about eight years before I transitioned into my doctoral studies. And during that time, I did um, enroll in the HEAL program. And one of the things that, you know, I quite resonated with the HEAL program is that it equipped me with the language to bridge my practice with theory within the classroom. So there was a lot of um, readings and a dialogue that happened that kind of sparked interest. And in, actually, I took back into the classroom, you know, that following week to to play and to grow and to learn more about my own practice within the classroom. Um, Carrie and I uh, recently presented at uh, the THESA conference, which is the Teachers of Home Economic Specialist Association in October. Um, and, you know, many people were concerned about scheduling and what that looks like and working full time. And, and truly for me, it really was a management of time, just like every other bubble that we have in our life that we're trying to juggle. And, um, you know, I, I knew that my Friday lessons were set. So Thursday nights were some were time for me to um, read, engage in dialogue. Um, the courses are completely online. And that dialogue could happen on your own time, your own pace. Um, whenever you wanted to post, someone else would respond. Um, and Carrie can speak to more of the courses and the course structure. Um, but in terms of um, that flexibility of doing work, life, and school at the same time. And so I, I truly want to reiterate the, the balance that it, it did provide. Um, and then the elective courses being in person was incredible um, and being able to engage with people on campus. Um, but again, online, I was connecting with people across Canada. There's an international student and you're seeing your interests and your context um, translated into other people's contexts. And so that's truly a strength of the HEAL program. Um, you know the good, the bad, and the ugly. The 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 balancing. It's you're you're balancing. Um, and so when to manage your time with that dialogue. However, I found it it was something that I I wanted to do and wanted to engage with. And the instructors within the Heal program were incredibly supportive in tailoring your journey and your interests. And so the amazing thing about home economics education is that it is quite interdisciplinary. So even though my interest was in food studies and food literacy, I was engaging with people who were um, into textiles. There were elementary 
elementary school teachers who were um, wanting to focus on school gardens. Um, there were um, individuals uh, working with indigenous ways of knowing, uh, teacher burnout. So truly it's, it's a holistic uh, program in which we um, engage with the materials, the research, uh, the projects, um, and really you, you, you get what you, you get out of it, what you put into it. And it, it truly helps kind of rethink about how I teach in the classroom. And, uh, it was a stepping stone to come back into graduate studies. So if that's not like a, haha, like a push for this program, then absolutely. Um, one thing that I remember um, from the Thesa conference, we had um, someone in our session um, worried about writing. Um, and the thing about the program is that it it helps you develop your skills in whichever way that you wish. And I personally struggle with writing anxiety. Um, and that's something that I I truly am like, I'm, I was telling the individuals, like, don't worry about it. Um, like in, in terms of grasping um, writing a, a, a research paper or it, it truly pertains to you and your interests. And I found I did a lot of narrative writing. It was very reflective of what I was doing in the classroom. And so that storytelling came out in my projects, my presentations. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of nuance into the program. And once we once we hit the Q&A session, um, I know Carrie has some questions that she throws at me. And I, again, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'm here um, available in the session and outside of the session as well. But it truly was an eye opening experience that allowed me to pause and reflect on um, how I do engage with my practice. And that, again, has fueled me into further graduate studies. Um, but yeah, looking forward to engaging with you in the chat as well. Thank you, Chrissy. Kevin, can I throw to you? Whoops. For some reason, it's going to beep at me. There we go. Can I throw to you to take us through some of the information about making applications and um, for the program? Of course. Um... Yeah, so we're now going to go through various admission and application related info. So firstly, for um, application requirements, um, all students must meet the admission and application requirements of both the Faculty of Graduate Studies and the program. Um, and these include one, a minimum of two years of engagement within schools, communities, business, government, non-government organizations, and other education-oriented environment. Also, um, a four-year undergraduate degree with sufficient standing, so that is an average within the B-plus range. That's roughly 76% at UBC for all senior-level coursework or an equivalent to that. Um, please note that this is not a hard cutoff point. Um, as shown on the slide, if your GPA does not meet the above criteria, let's say your field percentage is off, the department may submit a quote unquote special case rationale to recommend you for admission. If the if the rest of your um, application is considered to be strong enough, and it will be folks like um, Carrie who would be uh, writing your um, special case rationale. Um, also, uh, we would require three letters of um, recommendation. So these are your reference letters from educators, supervisors, colleagues, or clients that can speak to your capability and ability to complete the um, program and your interest in it. Um, Additionally, you're going to ask to submit a resume slash CV. Please note that this is not an employment resume. Um, this is a resume that is um, supposed to give um, staff and the admission committee a full overview of the capabilities and achievements. So there is no need to be brief like um, some employment resume. 
please take your time to make it as long and detailed as needed be. Also, you're going to be asked to submit a statement of intent. So it's maximum 600 words of your home economic experience, professional goals, and the anticipated benefit of your involvement in the program. And this statement of intent is also where you'd be making your case. Um, let's say if your grades are not quite um, up to par and you require a special case rationale, this is where you make your case as to why overall your application is um, still strong. And you also be asked um, to have ready scanned copies of all official transcript and degree certificate. So um, additionally, there is an English language assessment um, for uh, a lot of people who are applying. So, so applicants from a university outside of Canada where English is not the primary language of instruction must provide um, result of an English language proficiency exam as part of your application. Um, the test must have been taken within the last 24 months at the time of submission. Um, you can check out the link right there um, for the specific um, test and scores required. As for when you need to complete the uh, English test, it, the scores must be available when you press submit. It's not something where you submit your application and then you upload your scores retroactively. You cannot do that. Regarding the application procedure, um, it is an online application. It cannot be done in person. And if you show up at the um, department office, we cannot handle the application for you physically. Um, simply navigate to grad.ubc.ca forward slash apply forward slash online forward slash. Um, you'll be clicking apply online. Um, read the instructions that's shown and either log in with your CWL or create a CWL if you've never attended UBC. For those of you who are not current or previous UBC students, a CWL is basically your student account for anything UBC online related. Once you're logged in, in the degree program section, you have to type in the four character cohort designation of HEE8. Um, this information is on the um, program website as well. If you forget the cohort code, remember it's HEE8. You want to make sure that you're applying for the right graduate program and not another one by mistake. That has happened before. Sorry. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, please note that this is a part-time professional cohort and is different than the regular on-campus program. Select the program and click um, apply and fill out the rest of this application as shown. Um, the part two of the process would be supporting various documents. Please have um, the following ready to upload when you apply. These include official transcripts, both um, for Canadian transcripts and for international transcripts, you likely be asked to also um, upload your degree or program certificate as well. You'd be asked to upload, you know, the three reference letters, um, your 600 word statement of intent, your resume, and your English proficiency test scores if applicable. Um, please note that when you are actually admitted into the program, you have to provide official field transcripts with the exception of UBC to the um, Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. So basically when you're applying, you're allowed to submit scan. However, once you have been accepted into the program, you have to provide official transfer. Regarding the uh, upload of your reference letters, so uh, when adding them to your application, you'll be asked whether they are professional or academic references. We consider academic references as people who know you in an academic capacity, so former professors or instructors. And professional references would be those who have 
supervise you in a work setting. So maybe a principal, vice principal, or other non-educational supervisors. Um, you are strongly encouraged to submit electronic letters of reference. So what you do here is fill in the email addresses of your three references, referees um, when completing your online application. So you, you know, need their email address. Um, references with um, free web-based email addresses. So if your referees email address is Gmail or Hotmail, um, they'll receive a link to the paper reference form, which must be emailed, must be mailed to our um, office. Anyways, once you submit and pay for your online application, um, your referees will automatically receive an email with a link and instruction for completing the electronic reference. So they're going to receive a link where they can either type out their references or upload a Word or PDF document, all right? So for your referee to have a Gmail, Hotmail, or a quote unquote generic email address, um, the reference letter must be um, mailed to, um, to us. And it's very important that on the letter that the reference is coming in, um, within the reference letter, they have to say this is for H-E-E-A. And on the envelope where it is sealed, where the tape would be, they have to sign their name over it. This is to ensure that um, there's no fraud or application dishonesty going on. So um, as I've just said, for those of you choosing to submit your paper references, um, this is the uh, mailing address that you'd be mailing it to. Please kindly ensure that you indicate that this is for the HEEA graduate cohort, and that you will be sending this to the Professional Development and Community Engagement Office. Um, this is very important because UBC has many departments that handle transcripts and reference letters, and it's not uncommon for things to be sent, physically to be sent to the wrong address. So HEEA graduate cohort for the Professional Development and Community Engagement Office at 1304-2125 Main Mall. Um, So regarding the actual application deadlines, the application is currently open and accepting of applications. So you can um, apply as early as today right now. And the application deadline is March 1st, 2024. Um, this includes the submission of all supporting documents by that point. Under very specific um, cases, extensions might be given, but you have to notice us uh, in advance. Regarding the finances and tuition, um, there is a difference in cost between domestic and international applicants. Um, the tuition is assessed as an annual program fee, which is divided into three equal installments due at the beginning of each term, which is September, January, and May is payable over a minimum of eight installments. So that's one for each term of your program. And the tuition is charged as a whole program fee and is not assessed on a per credit basis. Tuition may be raised up to 2% annually. And if it does happen, it will be announced in the spring of each year. Please note that since this program is considered a part-time program, it is not eligible for student loans or other types of funding. However, obviously, if you're able to secure third-party funding yourself, that is on your end and that is okay. Regarding student fees, um, student fees are charged in addition to tuition and vary from term to term. You'll be asked to budget for approximately $800 to $900 per um, winter term. 
there are certain fees that you can opt out of. One is the medical slash dental plan. That's approximately $338 per year charged in September only. You're able to opt out of that if you wish. There's also the U Pass, which is a public transit pass in Vancouver for those of you who do not reside here. And it's approximately $180 per term. However, it's only opt out available if you live outside of the greater Vancouver area. Um, fees are subject to change annually and only information in the UBC calendar is official. So everything on this slide specifically is um, for reference only and is subject to change. And additionally, um, this is applicable for teachers in the Vancouver Lower Mainland who have taken UBC students in their classrooms as student teachers. You might be able to um, claim a quote unquote um, course credit, basically. So if this applies to you, please contact the teacher education office at teacher.ed at ubc.ca. This process is handled by um, you know, the CEO office and it's um, separate from the PDC office. So make sure you send it the right way. And that is basically the overview of the application and admission process and requirements. Please note that everything that was shown on the slides in this info session right here is also available on the program webpage and website. Oh, um, now it's the time for any additional questions or answers that you folks might have. If you have um, questions related to the actual program content or carry, um, you may ask it now as well. Kelvin, I'm going to stop sharing so that we're not looking at small tiles. Um, of course. Well, maybe we still are looking at small tiles. I don't know, but perhaps not so um, so distracted. Um, I think there are things um, that have uh, been covered that have been within the questions that folk um, sent in as they are registering for this session. Um, I, one, one of the questions, is there a thesis or a capstone? I think we've covered that there is a capstone. Um, and um, so that one is there. Um, one question is, does this could this translate into primary education? Um, and I seem to remember Chrissy talking about the fact that some of her colleagues were actually in elementary or primary education. Sorry, I come from Australia, so we talk about primary education, not elementary. Um, so yes, it does it does work across K to 12. Uh, and if someone is particularly interested in early childhood, I'm sure that there are many things that we could do to accommodate that as well, if there's an um, interested in that. Um, Okay, let me go through. Um, a couple of people have asked what the acceptance rate is for the program. Um, at the moment, we have got one of the largest cohorts running, which is 18 students. Um, we have gone down as low as 12 or 13. Um, but um, my experience has been that the only students, or sorry, the only applicants that we say thank you but no to are those that do not meet absolute minimum um, requirements um, for the program um, in a number of different areas, not just a one-off. As Kelvin indicated, um, some of us didn't do particularly well on our undergraduate programs. We were busy doing other things. Um, and so perhaps the grades weren't quite a B plus that is nominally required at this stage. Assuming that other things are coming together and you know maybe 15 or 20 years ago it was, um, we recognize that um, life goes on and we grow and we develop in lots of different ways. But if there's a weak statement of intent, if there's difficulties with um, low levels of um, GPA um, and so forth, then it's likely that that's going to be the combination while someone is not offered a place as opposed to we've got 20 applicants, we only have 18 places. That's not the way we run at all. Um, we're more than happy to accept as many eligible students as what we possibly can. Um, 
Antonetta, there's a question there. Since tuition is paid per term instead of per course, can more courses be taken, for instance, more electives? Um, the answer to that is yes, um, you may. However, in the middle of all of that, um, our priority is to get you through and to be successful. And so, yes, while you are enrolled in the program, you may take on more than the 30 credits. However, I will also be concerned to make sure that you are um, being successful while you have um, your, shall I say, grazing the, the um, banquet. Um, we also want to make sure that um, you are successful in what you're engaging with as well. So we can chat through any number of things. Kelvin, you have a hand up. Yes, and um, just to add to Carrie's point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, regarding electives, um, you may apply for electives from other universities as well under the WDA. We call it the Western Dean's Agreement. Correct. So that is definitely possible. However, before you take the course, it has to be approved by the graduate school first. And that process can take a while. So if you are planning to take an elective at another institute or university, um, please make sure to send your request form to us very early in advance because um, you cannot take the course and then retroactively apply for the approval. If you do that, it is very likely that um, your course won't be approved at all. And that would be a big waste of money on your behalf. Chrissy. Uh, just throwing on my student hat here and to, to elaborate on, on the question, um, you know, part of um, the MED program is to encourage uh, practicing professionals to explore their interests. Um, and so in in balancing your your coursework, um, there are, are quite a few online courses and in-person courses that are offered during the May to August semester. Um, and so I, you know, I actively encourage you to look at all the electives, see what you're interested in. But um, the in-person courses usually run um, in July and August for about a week. And so if you're outside of UBC um, Vancouver, um, there are courses that are in person that are about a week long, uh, but Agriculture in the Classroom uh, runs out of Abbotsford, BC um, in the Fraser Valley. So in thinking about um, your coursework and balancing life and work and school, there are many opportunities for you to take the electives during uh, the warmer weather seasons here in British Columbia um, and a great way to meet some of your cohort in person person. Um, you know, you you know your schedules, you know your life, but that's um, you know, in in part of UBC in in supporting their students, like Carrie said, in 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 hoping that you are successful, that these courses are offered during times in which you have access to them and maybe not uh, crunching for uh, report card season or times. Um, and I did I did mention, uh, you know, primary elementary school education, but I also had uh, a person in my cohort who is a professional home economist um, from Alberta. Um, and uh, it was great to chat with them about their perspective. So even if it is uh, you are not in the K-12 system, there are uh, many opportunities to connect with people um, in the community and community experience. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carrie, someone in the, the THESA conference, community experience is experience in, in working. Um, you don't have to have K-12 experience specifically. And so mm -hmm. that's something that is... Um, quite amazing about being uh, within a home economics major. Indeed. Now, Kevin's also put in the chat that um, some people think a master's program will give you um, a teaching qualification. Um, this one does not. Um, so you can come in, you can learn more about education, 
particularly home economics, but it will not give you a teaching cred credential. So just be aware of that. Um, Steph had um, a comment there that she's got lots of experience, but she's not a qualified home economist. My first thing to say is I'm sorry, um, but we'll get you across. We'll get you involved with home economics. That's not a problem. Uh, we don't have an expectation that you must have an undergraduate qualification in home economics. However, this program is unapologetically about home economics. So if you're coming in without a home economics background, uh, then this is a wonderful opportunity to be able to build some understandings um, and further information about home economics. Um, and that will be expected throughout it, but that doesn't mean it may not apply to the area of work or specialization that already um, is your area of work already. Um, so I'm hoping that that helps um, from that point of view. Um, I'm just quickly trying to go through, wow, lots of questions coming up. Um, can previous studies in fashion, diploma in fashion, um, be done as a credit? And I also think someone also, also asked about their diploma for home economics as well. If you've done some previous study in no more than five years time, you can actually claim those as electives as long as you have not already used those to claim a qualification. So if you've just engaged in some study, you've just engaged in one course or two courses, but you haven't done any other larger program, and they're no more than five years old, yes, you can have a conversation with me via email or phone or other method, and we can discuss it if it does fit in with it. Most of the time I say yes, because I want to support you. Um, so yes, always can have that conversation. However, it's important that we go back to uh, Kelvin's point that this will not impact on your instalments. Um, the Your enrollment into the HEAL program is a set price, if you will, for one of a better way of describing it. It does modify if there is a um, price hike, but essentially you're paying for coming into the program, not for the number of credits that you study. So while you may have some electives that you, you can use that you've done previously, it will not reduce the total price for your program. So I am sorry about that, um, but that's kind of the game rules that we're playing on um, from there. Um, Okay, Crystal's got a question. I feel like I'm doing answering um, Monday, you know, <laughs> mid-morning radio program. Um, Crystal's got that in January of 2027, oh, isn't that terrible? Um, everyone's working on the graduating party. Is that what we're doing or are there other coursework assigned? No, that's what you are doing. Um, you're coming to the end of your program. Um, you're coming around to the, the final lap and um, we want you focused in on that and getting it done. It doesn't sound like it's very much. Much, but can I throw to Chrissy? Did you need all of that time, Chrissy? Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, and I, um, I, I graduated in 2021. And so that was me going back into the classroom post COVID. So I actually did extend my um, EDCP 590 into the summer. Um, and so that was an extra um, an extra payment on top, but just due to the nature, that's the balance of, of life, work and school. And maybe that's, maybe that's the asterisks of the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, but, um, I, I personally needed that extra time because teaching during, uh, the 2020, 2021 year, um, was such a unique experience <laughs> and in balancing everything that was going on, um, especially as uh, my district was in the quarter system. Um, and just to go back into uh, Crystal's question, um, you know, the EDCP 590 that's um, in the January course, um, it's it's not um, you wandering out on your own, there is support. And so the previous course, the master seminar in home economics education, the 501 course, you're at, you've been building up for about two years of your interests and the questions that you have. Um, and you are set up in a way that is structured in, in, in completing that capstone project during that time. So it's not saying January 1st, you start your paper and April 30th, you have finished your paper. It is a culmination of your knowledge that you have built over time. And, uh, you know, there are some people in the, um, in the thesa conference who were, you know, kind of concerned about that. And, and, you know, you, you, you are not alone and you're not alone. Your cohorts going through the same process and, um, you know, in, in working your way through the coursework, it is, 
um, like the first course is foundations of home economics education. And it is quite the foundation and you're building up on that and exploring your own interests. And so in the May course, um, uh, I feel like I'm reliving the courses. I love it. Uh, the May course, you kind of develop your own proposal. And so it's not like, again, it's not January 1st, Apologies, I just got a phone call and so I might have lost connection. But in terms of you are not, um, it is structured in a way that you are building on your previous knowledge and you are supported in the in the dialogue, in the discussion posts, through your course instructor uh, to really um, flesh out your interests and your final paper. Uh, a, an example of a graduating paper. Wow. Okay. Lots of different ones that are there. Um, how long is a piece of uh, string is really, you know, I, it depends in lots of ways. Um, but the sorts of examples of things that people have written about um, vary. Um, one that was someone who actually walked from the Canadian border along the west coast of the US down to the Mexican border and actually kept a diary on the way through but reflected on their learning during the HEAL program through the previous years and melded something very, very beautiful together. And having never done that walk and being very, very new to Canada at that time, or certainly to the West Coast of, of North America, I found it absolutely amazing, the sorts of things and observations, but how it was linked into home economics education. Somebody else uh, lives in Saskatchewan and very, very strong farming background. And so her interest was trying to build uh, coursework uh, that enabled students in secondary schools to have a better appreciation of farmers, farmers' life, and what did it mean to contribute to the food supply. So she interviewed family members, neighbours, and so forth, and developed up a piece, a program, a, a coursework. Um, now, there was some literature that was framing it, but essentially the body of it was actually um, this course that was being proposed for middle to, to senior um, secondary. Chrissy, do you want to describe what you did on your graduating project? Uh, absolutely. Um, so my, as I mentioned, my interest is in within food literacy. Um, and so truly in my experience um, as a um, home economics educator within the classroom, I always got this notion of, oh, it's just home ec and, and quite literally the hand move it. Oh, it's just foods. It's just cooking. All we do is cook. And yeah, that's a facet of it where we do engage with demonstrations and labs and, and projects. Um, but so my interest was, it was about the language that people use, um, the, uh, outside the profession and within the profession, but what did that mean for my own personal practice? And so I actually explored the three facets of food literacy, um, of operational, cultural, and critical, and using student examples of um, what I did in the classroom to engage students with their own cultural backgrounds, with a, a critical lens, and how uh, food studies is more than just cooking, because uh, there is this notion of uh, stitching and stirring within home economics and the perception of how home economics is antiquated. Um, and so I think what was very evident with the COVID-19 pandemic is home economics came to the forefront because people were back into their homes um, and and being in their homes and, and providing within their homes. Um, there was a lot of social inequity that came out um, that was there um, but came to the forefront. And so, you know, our grocery store um, workers were frontline workers. And so there was a lot of dialogue and discussion uh, during that time of, you know, what is food literacy? Where does our food come from? Um, and engaging with these, um, this dialogue with students. Um, and so, you know, there is that asterisk of, um, it was informal discussions that I had with my students, so there was no need for an ethics application because it was a reflection on my own practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did I did little stories, I did little vignettes of 
you know, Miss Smith within the classroom. Um, and I had images of student uh, work. Um, so hopefully that can provide some insight of the, the varied um, nuances that you can bring your own uh, practice in. And I think one of the students did, um, uh, they did a weaving uh, project, um, a past heel student, a past heel student um, analyzed a curriculum, they've developed curriculum documents um, as a teaching chef. So there's a wide variety of things that it, it is truly your interest and in what you are connecting with your own practice. And I, I'm happy to delve into more questions as well. One of the other questions that came in earlier was uh, what the experience is like in the courses, individual courses. And, you know, if it's online, how much do we have to be together? How much is synchronous? How much is asynchronous? And to some extent, that will depend a little bit about who, what the instructor is wanting to do. But the general form and the way in which it works is it tends to be some readings each week. You put in a response and then by the end of the week, could you go in and please respond to one or two other people? Um, it's a little bit repetitive, but if you think about it, is that we're not together, um, it would take the place of a class discussion. And so how do you engage with people in your classroom and hear what they've got to say and how they're thinking about things um, when we're not all in the same space in the same time? So those discussions become really important. And so it's not just that you get get to read what other people are doing but people get to read a little bit about what you're about if you're a bit like me I don't like to be the first person who puts things up there are some people who are eager beavers and are up there first every time I like to take a little bit of time and linger with it and then sort of think about am I in the right space to do it and I must admit being online with those discussions allows for those introverts and extroverts to be able to work a little bit at their own pace how much time do you need to do normally um, a graduate class would be timetabled face-to-face um, -face, three hours a week. And then there's an expectation of at least three hours outside the class that you would engage with reading or if you're starting to prepare your assignments. So given that you don't have three hours face-to-face, -face, I think it's reasonable to think you should be setting aside three to four hours a week. Does it have to be in one block? Well, that's what your life is like. You might be better an hour one night where you do reading, another hour where you do some writing, and then another two hours where you dedicate to some other things. Um, I don't know what your life is like, but there's an expectation that you're producing things in particular timeframes. How you manage that, you're adults, you're able to work your way through those things. Um, some people open up each week, um, a couple of weeks ahead. I open up the whole course. Um, so when I'm with you, you'll see the whole thing from week one to week 12. Other people might just set up module one and that might be the first three or four weeks and let's get you through that and then open up subsequent ones after it. So what that means is if you are going gangbusters, if you want to go ahead, if you really want to push ahead, um, yeah, you can do that if that's the way in which you work and need to do. But you still need to come back and engage with your class colleagues as well. You can't just charge on ahead and just plough through without any connection with them. Some of the assignments are your own, you're doing solo, and some of them you need to do with a partner or with two other people. And so you do need to work in and around um, those sorts of obligations. I'm teaching the course this term. Um, last Saturday, um, we had nine presentations um, from 9.30 through to 12.30, and it was amazing. It was absolutely phenomenal, but people had worked very, very hard um, with their partner to be able to get it up, and we had a great morning together. Sounds horrible to think that that number over a morning, but there was lots of joy, lots of celebration, lots of really interesting stuff, and you could hear so much passion as people were engaging in different areas of their presentation. So some of that will be dependent on, as always, what the instructor would like you to engage with. I don't necessarily have any more questions that have come through um, from um, the previous ones. Um, Antonia's got one about references. All of the references have to be professional. Um, do they all need to be supervisory? Um, we've had people that have written references that are colleagues um, in the sense that they are both if you like, in a K-12 school, teaching at the same level, similar levels of experience that they've been able to. I think going back to Kelvin's point about they have to be able to talk to certain points about you, and one of them being about the, the potential that you have um, 
about being successful in the program, but also what the potential is for you to learn and grow through the program. If you've already got everything sorted now, this program isn't for you. If you're going to come into the program, yes, we're going to take some of your money. I'm sorry about that. Um, but also there should be some professional growth. This, you should be different at the end of the program, um, other than just being less some of your money, but there should be some other elements to you, your personality and your professional life um, that this program has added to. Um, and for Chrissy, um, she's come into a doctoral program, which she had no intention. She thought was going to be that sort of journey. And Chrissy, having been through the HEAL program um, and knowing you and your colleagues that went through the same cohort, do you think people were different to when they started? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think, I think you just kind of hit the nail on the head of, you know, entering the program and being open and, 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 and vulnerable in, in trying these new experiences. Um, I, I am glad I'm not the same person at the end of my program. You know, there's, there's so many different nuances that I was able to take back into my classroom and even through uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and what that that meant for um, transformative pedagogy and challenging the, the current systems that we have in place. And it really made me pause and reflect on my my own experiences and, and my position within the classroom and how we and how we connect um, you know, again, food is my love language, but how we connect people through food. And um you know, I, I think one of the things about the HEAL program that it, it is so interdisciplinary. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, it's like you you get what you put into it. However, it really helps you understand your own passion through different lenses. And so in understanding, um, you know, food through different lenses that a textiles person provided or indigenous ways of knowing, there's so much rich dialogue in which you can connect with other people that, yes, you can you can get um, in in-person courses, but, you know, it's very difficult to get to UBC at 4.30 on a Tuesday night. And so being able to connect um, across uh, the city, the province, the country, and even now globally um, truly has opened my eyes to home economics education and what that looks like in different contexts. Wow, there's whole lots of things coming in. All right, Antonia, I'm glad that you're excited by it um i hope you continue to be and you just don't cool off after this session so that would be lovely um steph um much of the program synchronous asynchronous absolutely right um the only thing well not the only thing the main thing that you need to think about is each course is offered in particular terms and that's on that table that um, I presented earlier and it's what's showing on the PDC website under the schedule. So those courses are done in order um, but how it's run within those courses is largely asynchronous um, and so whilst you're locked into a course at a particular term, um, how you engage with it during the term is much more um flexible for you in terms of your life and your commitments that you have outside study. Uh, the thing is, however, is that the courses are put up in a way to allow you to build uh, towards your graduating project. So in fact, the first year is about home economics, a bit of the foundation, but also exploring home economics in lots of different ways and what it might mean for our practices. But then the second year is actually starting to focus in on the research and starting to build up things to move you towards your graduating project and because of that I think we've been very very successful with students going through the program in that yes it's structured but it, we're not so tight about the way in which it's done but at the same time it's always about building step one step two and building and supporting you to get to your graduating project and a number of people um, have in this department have read um, graduating projects from HEAL students and they're incredibly impressed with them um, I'm not surprised because I know we have some amazing people who work in the area but it's incredibly gratifying that other people read some graduating pro projects and go wow this is absolutely amazing and we go of course it is um not surprising from that point of view how are we going everyone are we answering your questions are we hitting the right mark for you 
because I'm looking at the time um, with two minutes to go. Um, so I'm going to do last call for questions. Um, if you have other questions, um, Kelvin can talk about admissions and applications. Um, that's his area of expertise. That's his great support for this program. I can talk about the program and to some extent um, the application process in the sense about um, how we go through it and what we're looking for through that sort of process. But really, I'm post um, the um, acceptance of people into it. But um, the sorts of questions that people are asking, the concerns, will I fit, won't I fit, are not the sorts of things that would be the sort of thing that you would exclude you from the program, if that makes sense. So I'm hoping that that is um, useful for you. Thank you, Antoinette. We appreciate it. Kelvin.